and I will be reading verses 1 through 7. Let us listen to the gospel according to Mark. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but mules, or rules taught by men. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. And I call upon Bodvili Terrian to deliver the English sermon this morning. Thank you, Brother Jim. And I want to seize this opportunity to thank every one of you for being here with us today. In today's scriptural lesson, the audience of Jesus consisted of three different groups of people. First, there were the Pharisees and the scribes who raised the question of defilement, how a person could be defiled and how could he obtain cleansing from that defilement. I'll explain that a little later. The second group were the crowds, the ever-present crowds. Wherever Jesus went, he was surrounded by huge crowds because he had a magnetic personality that attracted people to him. Furthermore, his teachings were so authoritative, so new, so appealing, that he drew people to him like a magnet. Then the third group, consisted of his disciples who often had a hard time understanding the deeper meaning of Jesus' teachings. In today's passage, which we will discuss, Jesus makes it very clear that a person cannot be defiled externally. A person cannot become unclean by what he eats or drinks, but a person can be defiled by harboring evil thoughts and base desires in his heart. So more important than the food we consume is the condition of our heart. And this is what Jesus emphasizes more than anything else. We should not worry about what we eat or drink so much as we should worry about the state of our heart to make sure that it's void of evil thoughts and base desires. Now the question raised by the Pharisees and the scribes had nothing to do with personal hygiene. They criticized Jesus for allowing his disciples to eat food without the washing of their hands. Now, when you, when you read this passage for the first time, you may say, well, what's wrong with that? It's a good habit to wash your hands before you eat. 
But when we study this passage carefully, you will notice that the Pharisees had a hidden agenda and that this, this was a ritual or ceremonial washing that had nothing to do with personal hygiene. Actually, this ritual washing of the hands was a rule or regulation invented by the Pharisees. And Jesus calls it the tradition of the elders. The reason Jesus refers to it as the tradition of the elders because it has no basis in the Old Testament. Such a command is not found in the Old Testament. The Old Testament says the priests must wash their hands before they start offering sacrifices at the temple. But there is no rule governing the lay people. There is no rule that says the lay people, the ordinary people, had to wash their hands in the way the Pharisees had designed before eating food. I read this regulation in Jewish books. The Pharisees have compiled 65 pages that explain how a person had to ritually wash his hands before eating. <laughs> I don't want to waste your time, but I will summarize it for you. So the ritual washing of the hands was an elaborate ceremony. According to the teachings of the Pharisees, two empty egg shells must be filled with water. So imagine, two empty eggshells cannot hold much water. Then, they would raise the right hand upward like this, and pour the water from the first eggshell over the fingertips of the right hand, and keep the hand right in this upward position until all the water dropped from the bottom of the right elbow. Then they would repeat the same procedure for cleaning the second hand. This was a ceremony that took at least 20 or 25 minutes. Now the Pharisees claimed that their rules were actually the oral interpretations of the written law. But that's a false claim. Jesus calls those rules and regulations and conventions the traditions of the elders because they have no biblical basis. It was something that the Pharisees added to the word of God. It was something they added to the law. There are many such examples, but I'll, I'll mention, for example, the weekly fast which the Pharisees had established. If you study the Old Testament, you'll find that God commanded that the Jews fast only one day a year. And that fast is associated with the Jewish Day of Atonement, which the Jews call Yom Kippur. That's when they humbled themselves before God, confess all the sins they had committed throughout the year and ask for divine forgiveness. So the Yom Kippur fast is the only fast mentioned in the law of Moses. But the Pharisees, using their ingenuity, invented the weekly fast. They said every Jew must fast two days a week. And they specified those days. They said every Jew should fast every Tuesday and every Thursday. Why? Well, because the Pharisees surmised that it was on a Tuesday that Moses ascended Mount Horeb to receive the law from God, and it was on a Thursday that he came down from the from mountain carrying the two tables of the law. So, 
they obligated everyone to fast two days a week. And if people didn't follow those regulations, which the Pharisees invented, which had no biblical basis, they were labeled heretics. Unclean, defiled people. Another thing I want you to notice that this question which the Pharisees raised was not an innocent question because their intention was to find fault with the teachings of Jesus in order to condemn him later on. When this event happened, Jesus was in the city of Capernaum, which is near the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee. And Mark the Evangelist tells us that the Pharisees and scribes came from Jerusalem. The distance between Jerusalem and Capernaum is 90 miles. In those days that was an arduous journey that took at least five days to complete because they could not travel more than 20 miles a day. So why did they take all this trouble to travel 90 miles to come to Galilee just to ask a simple question? No, they came to find fault with the teachings of Christ so that they could indict him later on. How did Jesus respond? Jesus replied by a quotation from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 6 where God says these people honor me only with their lips but their hearts are far away from me. Then Jesus called them hypocrites because they were only interested in external things and paid no attention to the internal purity. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So internal purity is what's important. And this is what should be emphasized, not external appearances. Jesus exposed the Pharisees for being hypocrites by citing one example. If you continue reading the Gospel of Mark chapter 7 verses 9 to 13, you will find that Jesus refers to the to the law invented by the Pharisees called Korban. Now Korban is a Hebrew word which means sacrifice or an offering made to God. Well, what is this teaching? This, this law was invented by the Pharisees to circumvent God's law. You know the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. The Pharisees circumvented this law by teaching people that if they willed some of their personal assets to the temple, then they could be exempted from their obligation to care for their elderly parents. So if a Jew was willing to part with some of his personal assets, by donating them to the temple, then he was not obligated to care for his aging parents. Jesus cites this law to show how the Pharisees circumvented God's law by establishing vain traditions. Now, not all traditions are bad. Some traditions are good and beneficial. For instance, uh, being an Armenian, I cherish all the traditions that are associated with the Feast of Vartanans. Because 
They connect me with my roots. They connect me with my past. And they teach me to value my Christian faith more than any earthly treasure. Bartan Mamigonian and his comrades were willing to die for the preservation of their Christian faith. Whenever I read the traditions associated with Bartanans, I am inspired to remain loyal to Jesus Christ and to his gospel. So some traditions are good and beneficial, but there are some traditions that are meaningless that distract us from what is essential and vital for our Christian faith. I grew up in Jerusalem within the Armenian community. And I remember a feast called Diyarim Taraj. This feast was observed toward the end of February. And in the evening of that feast day, people gathered in a large field in the Armenian quarter where they lit bonfires. Pe people gathered around those bonfires, played accordions, sung secular songs, and then they jumped over those bonfires. I know that many young people did not go to church that day. They did not go to church on, on that feast day. But they all assembled at that field to jump over the bonfires because it was fun. It was just plain amusement. And they didn't know what they were doing. If you ask them why they jumped over the fires on that feast day, um, they had no answer. They would say just, it's fun. Not knowing that this is a remnant of the religion of Zoroastrianism that the Armenians had before they conversion to Christianity. Jumping over fires is a Zoroastrian religious practice that still carried on in Iran, even by the Muslims. If you lived in Iran, then you know that during the last Wednesday of each year, the Persians lit bonfires and jumped over them. They still do it today. The Persian New Year starts on the spring equinox, March 21. But the Wednesday preceding their new year is when they lit bonfires and jump over them. But when the persons jump over those bonfires, they, they chant or say the following sentence. They say, O oh fire, give me your brightness and take away the pain, the pale color of my countenance. Of course, the Armenians, when they jumped over those bonfires, said nothing. <laughs> uh, they only received applause from the spectators if they jumped too high. Well, this is a meaningless tradition that distracts from what is essential and important for the Christian faith. As I said, Many of the young people I knew did not go to church that day, but they went, they participated in jumping over those bonfires. And they didn't know what they were doing. Probably they thought they, feel, they fulfilled a divine obligation. The Pharisees considered their traditions, their rules and regulations to be more important than love. And Jesus reversed that. Jesus made love the supreme virtue in Christianity. Christianity is the religion of love. It's the only religion that says God is love. 
And if we are the children of God, we have to resemble our Heavenly Father and be loving and lovable people. Now, if your religion makes you an uncaring, unkind, cruel person, then that religion is not Christianity. The Pharisees and their students, their followers, followed the spirituality of avoidance. Do you know why they established the law of the, the ceremony, the washing of the hands? To wipe away the presumed dirt or contamination that they had acquired by their direct or indirect contact with the Gentiles, the Samaritans, the Romans and other non-Jews. So the Pharisees and their students practiced the spirituality of avoidance. They felt they had to keep themselves undefiled, undefiled by shunning the Gentiles, by shunning all non-Jews. And if they happened to meet a non-Jew, then they became defiled and they had to wash away that contamination by their ceremonial washing of the hands. You see, it wasn't done for hygiene, it was done to wash away the presumed defilement that they had acquired by, by the Gentiles who lived among them. For this reason, the Pharisees and the scribes avoided every contact with the Jew, with non-Jews. They avoided all lepers, they avoided all tax collectors, they avoided prominent sinners, they avoided all those who had moral failures. So their spirituality was that of avoidance. Now, Jesus advocated the spirituality of involvement and inclusion. Jesus touched lepers. He befriended tax collectors, visited their homes, ate food with them. He allowed women to touch him in public, which was a taboo for the Pharisees. And whenever Jesus traveled between Galilee and Jerusalem, he passed through Samaria. He had no qualms about traveling through Samaria. This was something which the Pharisees never did. When the Pharisees wanted to travel from Galilee to Jerusalem or vice versa, they did not go through Samaria, which was the direct road. They skirted Samaria. They went around Samaria so they would avoid the Samaritans, whom they considered to be defiled. The spirituality of involvement and inclusion encourage us to establish solid solidarity with all sinners and extend to them a helping hand. The Pharisees' main concern was to keep themselves externally pure. Jesus' concern was to change the world. And to change the world, we have to mingle with people. So Jesus tells us a person cannot be defiled externally. The defilement comes from within us. So, if you read the epistle of James, there you will find that he tells us, by the way, James the apostle was a half-brother of Christ. 
And he converted to Christianity after Jesus' resurrection. And he became the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. By the way, if you go to Jerusalem and visit the Armenian Cathedral of St. James, you will find that St. James, the, the, the brother of Christ, and the first leader of the first Christian church, is buried under the main altar of the St. James Cathedral. And where the Armenian Patriarchate exists today was the residence of James the Apostle, whom the Jews killed because of his devotion to Jesus Christ. Jesus was nicknamed the friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, James tells us in his epistle that the true religion that is acceptable, acceptable to God is helping the widows and orphans in their distress. In those days, widows and orphans were the most vulnerable people in, in society. They were the most helpless people. There were no government social programs to help them. And the Christian church helped the orphans and the widows by establishing a special ministry for them. You remember the church elected seven deacons to care for the widows and the orphans. That was their primary duty. I liked what, what someone has observed. This fellow is anonymous. I don't know his name, but I read this observation that he has made. He says, Christianity today is like a football game where 22 men are on the field who are desperately in need of rest, being watched by over 40,000 people who who desperately need to exercise. That's, that's a very true, true observation. Today being Rally Sunday, the beginning of a new cycle in the life of the church. Now that summer is over, our vacations are over, let us resolve to be actively involved in the work of the church. Don't be mere spectators, but become active participants. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for having helped us to start a new season in our church life. As we transition from summer into the fall, help us to discover the possibilities that are in store for us. We realize that the summer vacations have caused us to miss some of our routines. And now we implore you to reorient us to your schedule and to redirect our lives to first seek you and your kingdom. We pray for our spiritual brothers and sisters who are sick and ask you to heal them, to heal their infirmities and restore them to health. This morning we intercede with you on behalf of our ancestral homeland whose existence is being threatened by our perennial enemies who want to wipe Armenia off the map of the world. Please, Father, intervene and save us from suffering a second genocide. Awaken the peace-loving nations of the world to lend us their active support and to stop and frustrate the evil schemes of our enemies. Father, provide comfort, consolation and support 
to the families of our martyred soldiers, shelter those who have become homeless as a result of the Turkish assault on Armenia, and heal the wounded warriors, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.